2014, the biggest ever outbreak of Ebola wreaking havoc in West Africa. New depths of terror in the Middle East. Tensions turning violent in Eastern Europe. A world struggling to cope as crises piled up. The United Nations called on world leaders to be resourceful, nurture the seeds of hope, and unite in decisive action. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. From barrel bombs to beheadings, from the deliberate starvation of civilians to the assault on hospitals, UN shelters, and aid convoys, human rights, and the rule of law are under attack. In Iraq and Syria, spillover effects of conflict uprooted more than a million people. Foreign fighters used the power vacuum to get large areas under their control, shocking the world with extreme violence. Frightened locals fled into the remote Sinjar Mountains. Thousands were seeking shelter in an unfinished high-rise in Doha. I am lucky my family wasn't killed, but close friends of mine lost their families. Whole families gone, killed, exterminated. UN aid agencies started huge operations to airlift supplies to remote and dangerous areas. More funding is needed to prepare the camps for a harsh winter. In September, world leaders in the Security Council united to adopt a historic resolution to fight this new form of terrorism on all levels. Security Council President Barack Obama. Nations are required to prevent and suppress the recruiting, organizing, transporting, or equipping of foreign terrorist fighters, as well as the financing of their travel or activities. The elimination of Syria's chemical weapons program showed what can happen when the Security Council is united in its determination. The most critical chemicals were neutralized on board of a ship. This deal was brokered by the U.S. and Russia and overseen by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and the U.N. Special Coordinator, Sigrid Kog. What is important, however, that all the materials are out of harm's way and that destruction can start as soon as possible aboard the U.S. ship. Israeli-Palestinian violence flared up in the wake of the kidnapping and murder of three Israeli teenagers in June. Weeks of conflict and retaliation left more than 1,300 Palestinians and 60 Israelis dead. People in Gaza had no safe place to go. More than 100,000 Palestinians sought shelter in UN schools. Six times UN schools were shelled. The only power plant was destroyed. Almost half a million people lost their homes. Ban Ki-moon visited Gaza to jumpstart the international reconstruction effort. Do we have to continue like this? Build, destroy, and build and destroy. We will build again, but this must be the last time to rebuild. This must stop now. They must go back to the negotiating table. In Ukraine, an internal political crisis transcended into violent clashes in parts of the country, reaching full-scale conflict in the East. Conditions deteriorated, with serious consequences for the country's unity and stability. Despite a ceasefire agreement, the situation remains extremely fragile. In July, a Malaysian Airlines plane broke apart over Ukraine due to penetration by a large number of high-energy objects from outside the aircraft, killing almost 300 people from nine countries. The UN Security Council urged to speed up the investigation and prevent similar tragedies from happening again. In the Central African Republic, sectarian violence and reprisal killings between Christians and Muslims left the country fractured and traumatized. People marched with machetes through the capital, sending thousands to flee and hide in the bush. The UN mission's call for voluntary disarmament saw only low turnout. Cash for Work programs try to promote cooperation between the factions. In a tense security situation, two million people still need humanitarian aid. Twenty years after the genocide in Rwanda, the UN charts a new approach, putting people first by giving their human rights priority so that the world would not have to say again, never again. The Human Rights Upfront initiative 
aims to place human rights at the center of all efforts in the field. Since genocide takes a careful planning, we must be vigilant for the early warning signs of human rights violations that lead to wider conflict and mass atrocities. In South Sudan, the need for early action against human rights violations led to providing shelter for nearly 100,000 people at the UN bases. The logistical challenges were tremendous, especially during the rainy season. Peacekeeping clinics even had to deal with delivering babies. Security Council members traveled to South Sudan to urge the local leadership to engage in reconciliation and left disappointed. U.S. Ambassador Samantha Power. Cessation of hostilities agreements have been agreed to, pieces of paper have been signed, uh, but you know better than I do that the fighting continues, violations of the cessation of hostilities happen every day, people are still dying. In 2014, the world counted more than 50 million refugees, the highest number since the end of World War II, a population that would make up the 26th largest country on Earth. Host countries and the UN were challenged to provide life-saving supplies and hope for a future. Women and children often suffered the most. Malala Yousafzai, who later won the Nobel Peace Prize, visited Zartari camp in Jordan to promote more accessible education for all children. All have a dream, some wants to become a doctor, some wants to become engineers, and some wants to become journalists. Afghanistan, still one of the biggest source countries for refugees, went through disputed presidential elections that ended in an agreement to form a government of national unity. Even with a fragile peace, conditions for civilians and peacekeepers alike remained dangerous. Four UN colleagues were killed when the Taliban attacked a restaurant in Kabul. Worldwide, through the end of October, 113 Blue Helmets paid with their lives for the cause of peace. In Mali, a convoy hit a landmine. Four peacekeepers died. Two others were killed in a suicide attack. In Darfur, three peacekeepers were killed in a sudden attack while protecting a water borehole. Morning in Guinea. When little Emile died, nobody imagined his village would become ground zero for the worst Ebola epidemic ever recorded. Spreading like wildfire, the disease turned Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia upside down. By December, more than 6,000 people had died. The living were paralyzed in fear. Economy and health services had nearly collapsed. As treatment centers overflowed, the international community had to speed up its response. Margaret Chan, Director General of the World Health Organization. This is a social crisis, a humanitarian crisis an economic crisis, and a threat to national security well beyond the outbreak zones. The Security Council urged speedy action to fight the epidemic. The UN's Ebola emergency response mission was deployed within days. An unprecedented airlift operation has started to bring ambulances, field clinics, and medical supplies to the affected countries, as well as food to people who can't go to markets or to their fields. Clinical trials for two vaccines have started. It is a race against time. Anthony Banbury, head of the UN mission for Ebola emergency response. We haven't been able to put the elements of the response in place everywhere. And where it's lacking, we see the significant or, or very uh, bad situation in many of these communities. That's got to be the focus of our efforts going forward, spreading out our geographic response. A sign of hope are survivors, like Sa, who is now immune and joins the fight against Ebola in his community. International donor support remains strong, says David Nabarro, the Secretary General's Special Envoy on Ebola. The extraordinary thing about this is that the whole world is willing to have a quick and successful response to this outbreak. Meanwhile, the Earth is sitting on thin ice. 2014 may set a record as the hottest year ever. Ban Ki-moon traveled to Greenland to inspect the status of Arctic glaciers and called for action to curb global temperature rise. In New York, 400,000 people, including world leaders and celebrities, marched for a cleaner, greener future. There is no plan B 
because we do not have planet B. At the UN Climate Summit, 120 world leaders joined forces with business, finance, and energy leaders and heard an urgent plea from Leonardo DiCaprio. We are seeing extreme weather events and the West Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets melting at unprecedented rates, decades ahead of scientific projections. None of this is rhetoric and none of it is hysteria. It is fact. Kathy Jetnell Kajena from the Marshall Islands wrote a poem for her daughter. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's becoming a climate change refugee. Or should I say, no one else. World leaders pledged action. French President Francois Hollande. C'est la conférence de Paris de 2015. It is the Paris Conference of 2015 that will make it possible to reach an ambitious global agreement so that we attain a carbon neutral status, a greenhouse gas emission level that is compatible with absorption capacities for the globe. At the summit, over $200 billion of financial assets from the private sector were committed to move to greener investments. The UN General Assembly Hall was restored, renewed, and upgraded for the 21st century. Now, on the eve of its 70th anniversary and amidst mounting challenges, the UN seeks to restore unity of purpose amongst its diverse membership. Global poverty, child mortality, and maternal death have been cut in half. More remains to be done. But these and other gains show the power of the Millennium Development Goals and what we can do when we work together. Global conversation has started on a sustainable agenda for the next 15 years. Amina Mohammed, the Secretary General Special Advisor on post-2015 development planning. By 2030, we can end poverty, we can transform lives, and we can find ways to protect the planet while doing that. Building a future we want includes ending the marginalization of indigenous people as projected at their first world conference in New York. It includes climate change resistant agriculture like here in Samoa, access to sustainable energy for all, and access to toilets and sanitation for the billion people who have none. To give children a glimpse of a brighter future, UNICEF brings e-learning to out-of-school refugee children in Lebanon and to children in remote villages of Sudan through low-cost tablets. Children have a right to innovation, to start discovering new solutions to local and global problems. Celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, UNICEF reminded to imagine. <laughs>